Welcome to the latest edition of IDS Talks podcast. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you all to uh, Phil Ogan. Um, Phil is a forensic expert and ATM specialist who's joined uh, me and my team of uh, colleagues here at IDS. And uh, we thought for our podcast subscribers, it'd be a great opportunity to meet one of the newer members of our team. Um, and if this is your first time uh, at an IDS Talks podcast, please uh, go ahead and subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. Phil, welcome to the IDX Talks podcast. How are you? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've been really looking forward to this uh, to this podcast because your background is so interesting uh, to me. So um, let's start with the forensic side of the background and then dig a little deeper into your uh, experience with ATM machines. Okay. Well, it actually flipped. Um, I, my experience with the ATM stuff came before the forensic. So it, it was sort of, it was an interesting mixture. But really what happened, I, I worked for a company, NCR Corporation, which is one of the, if not the biggest, ATM manufacturers, distributors, servicers in the world. And I got involved in this about 25 years ago, forced to literally, uh, as we got really heavy into the market. Um, I started off as an ATM investigator, and then it just sort of morphed into the forensic piece in, in uh, the late 90s, 2000. And what we found out through trial and error is that forensics played a heavy part in ATM investigations. So it just sort of all came together. Ah, all right. So, so for me, an ATM investigation in college involved, why can I only take $20 out? But it turned out after my analysis, it's because I had $25 in the bank account. Um, but I'm going to guess that the analysis and the forensics work you've done on ATM machines is a little more, uh, involved, uh, than that. So, um, let, let me start with this, Phil. Um, a lot of people simply think of an ATM machine as um, a container of cash that I enter my passcode in, I hit a button, I get my dollars out of. But it's actually much more than that. So can we, can we start there with an explanation of what an ATM machine really is? Well, here's what it really is. Uh, an ATM, literally an ATM machine is nothing more than a PC, a computer that dispenses cash. It has four dispensers with it. It has the exact same configuration for the most part a PC has. It has an operating system. It has a BIOS. It has a monitor. It has a printer. It has a keyboard. The other piece of this is, is underneath that PC, if you can picture, uh, a big metal chest with four cassettes inside it full of cash. And, and it takes instructions from the bank to dispense your cash. That's really at the at the highest level. That's that's what we look at. Okay, so if it's if it's essentially a, a computer that's there, what types of data is either on that computer or transmitted via that computer? Well, there's there's a lot of data actually. If you look at it, the, the easiest way to look at it is you look at an ATM. It's just a dummy box taking instructions from a banking network saying, yeah, Jonathan, you have $50 in your account. You can take out 20 or no, you don't have that amount and we're not going to give it to you. However, you can also, we'll open this little can lid up right here and, and you can deposit cash. So literally that's all it is, is a dummy box taking instructions. So when you were doing a forensic analysis on these machines and looking at uh, what was going on with the data. What what types of investigations were they? What types of matters were they? What were you looking for? Well, a lot of times, it, most of the ATM investigations I did was the physical missing of cash. That's where, you know, a bank would call me and say, Phil, we're losing. We've lost $20,000 out of this ATM. And then that the wheels start going in motion. Well, how did that happen? Did the money even make it there? And if it made it there, how, why is it missing now? And really there's, there's, there's John, there's three types of, of theft that occurs at an ATM. There's the identity theft where 
people put little cameras up and, and watch you put your PIN number in. There's the logical theft of an ATM where they, they compromise the network and is able to get in there and manipulate the instructions on the ATM to dispense cash. And then you got the guys who just wrap a chain around it and pull it out of the pull it out of the wall. So more than likely, and most of the time, it was always about 95% of the time, it was your identity te- theft, your skimmers, for example. People, the, the bad guys would put a skimmer overlay on top of the keyboard. And from there, your investigation starts to take a different turn. Okay, interesting. So you, you brought up the keyboard. The, the thing that um, I've always been told, go to the ATM, look where you put your, your, your card through, see if it looks thicker than it should, even grab it and shake it to make sure that there's not a skimmer on it. So you brought up two things. One, something related to the keyboard, skimmer Mm -hmm. on the keyboard. And you also talked about cameras being set up to see me as I'm entering my pin. Can you just expand a little bit on both of those two? Sure, well, first off, your bad guy always needs your pin number, always. And we've seen in the past on many investigations where they would have the little spy cams that's able to look down on the keyboard and see you put in your pen of one, two, three, four. Once they've got that and they've got the little skimmer overlay on top of your, your keypad, they're off to the races. They, they can basically take your identity and be able to dispense cash without you knowing it. And, and in fact, no more than uh, a month or so ago around where I live, that actually happened at a gas station kiosk where a skimmer was was placed, they had a a spin camera and basically was able to to do a lot of identity theft off the machine. Got it. So so, um, leads me to my next question. Uh, And I was thinking about it when you described an ATM as a a computer of sorts with some other things attached to it. You just brought up gas station kiosks. So I imagine there are a lot of systems out there that are similar to ATM machines that could still benefit from or require an investigation or or investigations much like you were doing when you were just focused on ATM machines. That's right. A lot of it, if you think about it, there's not much difference than a gas station kiosk and an ATM kiosk. One dispenses cash, the other one dispenses gasoline, correct? So if you got that, it's it's transaction fraud. And we had ran into to several of those where where we find out that through through overlays and skimmers and stuff that they're they they can put cameras on that as well. So they're very similar. If you can investigate an ATM, you can investigate a kiosk. So really, so really what it is, is, is while your experience has been in the ATM space, the reality right. is we're talking about devices and data sources from different places, gas stations, other point of service kiosks, but anywhere where there's a terminal transmitting information from the terminal to somewhere else is something that is not only susceptible to potential thieves, but sources of, of data that might need to be investigated for any of the number of purposes we talked about so far. That's correct. That is correct. In- interesting. Interesting. Um, well, let me, let me, you know, ask you this. So um, I like money. It would be nice to work around a lot of money. I know you didn't get to take that money, but, uh, you know, for, you said for, I don't remember if it was 25 years that you were in the, you know, working, at, um, in the, in the ATM space, but, you know, we were lucky enough to get you to come here to IDS. I'm sure some of our, our listeners would be interested in hearing about what brought you to IDS. Well, going back to, to early on in the discussion, when we started to learn early on that, that your ATM investigations needed a lot more robust tools to be able to investigate. And that's where, if you remember in early 2000, how the forensic world started to explode a little bit 
and get bigger with better tools and other forensic companies. We started to leverage those. We started to use uh, stuff like Encase and FTK and image the hard drives and look at the memory on the machine. And that helped us in our analysis and investigation. In fact, it broke many, many cases. And of course, a lot of this stuff is FDIC, the money's insured, right? So we're working with the we're working with the Secret Service. We're working with the local law enforcement. So, so are there, you Phil? There's are, a lot to play in that. Yeah. So, are you primarily dealing with the bank or the financial institution? Is it the ATM company? Is it internal counsel at one of the at the institution, the bank, or the ATM company, or is it external law firms? Really, who's who's our prime? Who's the primary person or or people you're dealing with? The primary person you're dealing with is is the customer. For example, Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, PNC, they have all these machines deployed. And what they do, instead of uh, managing all of that, they farm it out to a service provider. For example, NCR, DBOL, Wincor, whoever. And they say, okay, John, here's all of our fleet of machines. We want you to manage that. But you're also responsible for any losses that occur on that machine. Well, obviously the honus fell back on us and we had to have our own investigators that that actually could work directly with the bank and the cash and transit companies because you've got three parties, three primary parties, not attorneys. You've got your banks, your CITs, your cash and transit and your service providers who have access to the machine. So those are your three, and you have to be able to investigate all three. Got it. Okay, so the first person to perhaps notice something suspicious could be the consumer, the bank customer. It could be right. the it could be the institution itself if it's if it's uh, theft of of money, right? Um, right. So I'm guessing that the individual is not the one who's contacting IDS. Are you saying that it could be the bank or it could be any of the three that you just laid out who would be the ones to contact IDS for our services? Yeah, it could. It could be a bank. It could be a service provider who's in dispute with the bank and said, hey, we need a neutral party to come in and investigate this. The bank's not taking our word for it, vice versa. Um, And then we would step in and we would handle our investigation and give them an unbiased report as to what happened to that money, what happened to the fraud. Got it. So go ahead. It can start off as this internal investigation and can morph into something much more complicated and and even legal proceedings. Right. That's correct. And this this happens. it, It has happened in my career many times where a bank doesn't necessarily believe the service provider. They don't necessarily believe the cash in transit. So they'll, they'll agree. All three will agree or both will agree and say, hey, okay, let's get an independent consultant to come in. Let's see what happened to this. And I had to do that many times with other uh, forensic consulting teams. And whatever well, their, their resolution was, was what we, we delivered. So have you had to testify in any of these types of uh, situations, Phil? Yes, yeah, several times. Several times. We were unbiased. We just basically laid our reports out and said, this is this is what we believed happened to this cash. This cash never made it to a machine to begin with. It's still in a vault. They, they didn't manage it correctly. Uh, there's different types of, of how those shortages occurred. People, internal theft. We've had uh, service providers literally who had access to the ATM who went in and serviced the machine and then took out ten, twenty thousand dollars and fled to Mexico, for example. So sure. And so having having testified on behalf of these organizations before, I you know, I'm gonna ask the question. Um and I, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because our listeners may be interested too. Since you've testified in that capacity before, now being here at IDS, if you're the one doing the investigation, you're perfectly comfortable and qualified to testify as an expert now, right? Sure. Absolutely. And we're going to get better. I mean, I'm going to take a lot of my skills and my knowledge, and I'm going to pass it down to the forensic team and 
this is really looking like it's going to be a good opportunity for us. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, Phil, the, you know, the purpose of this podcast was to, to introduce you to, uh, to our listeners. Um, what I'd love to do, I'd love for us to have a follow on IDS talks podcast where we dig into a couple of the examples without naming institutions, perhaps, but some examples right. where you did an investigation, uh, where you testified. And then what I'd also like us to do is walk through how IDS would handle this type of situation, because, you know, we are known as consultative experts using a structured process to provide customized mm -hmm. solutions. I think that uh, it would be really interesting to take your real world experience, share it with the group, and then also share how we as an organization here at IDS would approach it. So, you willing to uh, do one more of these podcasts, if not more with me, Mr. Ogan? Absolutely. Love this. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, um, I'm thrilled that you joined the IDS team. Uh, I appreciate you spending some time with me today in our IDS Talks podcast. Again, to those of you who are uh, first time listeners, uh, please go to your uh, podcast uh, provider of choice and subscribe. For those who are longtime listeners and subscribers, we appreciate you taking the time. Phil, thank you again, and I look forward to our next podcast. Thank you.